Hi, let's talk about video games. Are you ready? What you're seeing right now is a picture of my eighth grade Christmas present. This is Pong. It was made by a company called Atari and it came on a big console. It was kind of the size of a DVD player. And you could play tennis back and forth. That's what you did. You had a little knob that controlled your tennis player. You could play doubles if you got crazy. We played for hours. Invited the neighbors over to see our Pong game. I'm trying to tell you that the technology you have as far as video games is phenomenal compared to the technology that I had. I know. Don't you feel sorry for me? Bill Gates says the video game industry is bigger than Hollywood. That's because the video game industry makes more money. Did you know that? I mean, think about it. A movie ticket's 10 bucks, right? How much is a new Xbox 360 game? 60? Right? My kids will buy those without even thinking about it. So we part with our money very easily in the video game industry. In fact, some consoles require special controllers for special games, and those are expensive too. There's so much money. So that's one reason we need to study video games is because of the sheer money involved. They're a super concentrated industry. Very few companies are involved in the production of video games and video game distribution. Video games are luring people away from traditional media, and that's definitely true in our, in our family because my boys would probably rather play video games than watch TV and I actually encourage that but we'll get to that in a minute. Video games are filled with advertising. In many cases they're used as advertising. They're used all over the world and they're played on every format. So to have a media class that doesn't talk about video games is crazy. It's crazy. We have to talk about it. Okay so really when we talk about video game history, when your book talks about it, it almost sounds like they're starting with pinball, right? This is Baffle Ball from 1931. It was just one moving part, and when your ball went into the hole, you were done. Here was a big change. Just two years later, the game was called Contact. The ball came back. All right, now bear with me. Here's the big one. Humpty Dumpty, 15 years later, had six flippers, and if you got a certain score, you got to play again. Now, this is the beginning of what I think make video games different than every other medium. And it's the reward factor. Okay? It's that reward that you get for reaching a certain level. And if you think about it now, video games now have loads and loads of different reward levels. You know, new skins, new helmets, new uniforms, new weapons. You're, you're constantly working towards something. And that's a different experience than it is with other media. All right, so let's talk about Steve Russell. He started the Tech Model Railroad Club at MIT, which I guess would be the equivalent of the um, super nerds of the super nerds at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He created a game called Space War. He didn't think he could make money from it. Now, if you look at this picture, what game did he invent? It's asteroids, okay? Space War was the favorite game of a man named Nolan Bushnell, and he figured out a way to make money with coin-operated machines, so he started a company called Atari in 1972. So Steve Russell programmed the game. Nolan Bushnell made it accessible to everybody, okay? Now, these are some of the games that I played when I was in high school. So there's... Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, Frogger, Miss Pac-Man, Space Invaders, and Galaga. Galaga was actually uh, one of my favorites. <laughs> now, 1993 brought Doom. The difference with Doom was that it was a first-person shooter game, meaning that you were seeing the action through the eyes of someone in the game. You weren't watching the game. You were in it. And that's very different. If you look back at these games, you're just watching the action, right? You're not partaking in it. Here, you were in it. You know, the graphics are terrible, but come on. It's 25 years ago. No, oh my gosh. Yeah. Anyway, it was a computer game hit because that was really the only place to play video games at the time if you were in your home. The demographics of video game players might surprise you. The average player is actually 30, okay? Almost half of the gamers are female. Now, the most recent statistics say that a gamer spends about 6.8 hours a week. I think that's low. I think that's really low. Um, I've had students in the past spend 24 hours playing Call of Duty after the new one comes out in November. They don't even get up to eat.
It's amazing. It's amazing. So I think 6.8 hours is low. Extra games is the term for games that were produced to combat this idea that video games made us all obese. So it started with uh, DDR, Dance Dance Revolution, then you had the Wii, then you had the, um, the uh, oh my gosh, we have it in our basement. What's it called? The Xbox, um, the motion detector Xbox thing. What's that called? Ugh. Connect, thank you, the Xbox Connect. Um, I thought the graphics for the Wii were kind of crappy, but the concept was cool. The Xbox Connect blew away my expectations. Um, the things that you can do on the Xbox Connect are, are fabulous. And yeah, you end up sweaty. It's awesome. It's awesome. Most games are made by third-party publishers. EA is the most common one that you might be familiar with. The reason that is is that the licenses are so expensive. Think about it. For the Madden football game, you'd have to pay the licensing fee to use the logo of every single NFL team. Those are so expensive. Same with NCAA teams. Same with NDA. Um, also, like if you are building Forza or uh, Project Gotham, you need the licenses for the cars that you're driving. I mean, it's, it's so expensive, and that's why not many companies do it, because it's so hard to get started. All right, so we've got the massively multiplayer online role-playing games. I have never done one of these. Um, we'll talk about it in class, especially Second Life. I just love the way that Second Life is even named. Like it, it says in its name what's in, what it is intending to do. Advertising within games is more prolific and more um, popular than ever, mainly because we don't notice, we can't flip through the commercials, and the ads can be very specifically targeted to us. For example, you know the group of people playing uh, Grand Theft Auto compared to the group of people playing Roller Coaster Tycoon, right? So you can advertise to them in a very specific way in a delivery system that they aren't going to mind because they have engaged it themselves, okay? Product placement is super effective for the same reason that advertising is. Because you, you can't change the channel. It's a part of the story. It's a part of the story and it's brilliant, brilliant. Advergaming is the term for games that are actually based on certain brands where you can't tell the difference between the commercial and the game. So these are just some examples like, you know, the Lucky Charms guy has his own game, SpongeBob has a thousand games, even John Deere has his own game, has their own game about farming. So the idea here is to get consumers to connect with your brand through a game. And it's smart. It's really smart. Advocacy gaming is a way to teach people about certain social issues through gaming. The whole term for all of this is called gamification. And a lot of teachers are really into gamification, meaning that we learn things and, and solve puzzles and we're patient playing video games. These are long processes. But we sit in front of an algebra, you know, an algebra problem and we don't like it. We don't want to work on it. The idea behind gamification is if you set up everything as a game, we learn without realizing that we're learning. And some people think that that's kind of a cop out and I can totally see it. Like I've, I've witnessed it when we go to the zoo, we went to the zoo once a couple years ago and my youngest said, mom, that, um, that habitat for that hyena is, is totally wrong. Okay. If I had told him that he was supposed to study the habitats of zoo animals, he would have thought I was crazy, but he spends enough time on Zoo Tycoon. He knows what certain animals like and don't like and what they need. And so he's learning without realizing that he's learning. It's like a sneak attack, a sneak attack of knowledge. So are game ratings effective? Mm, I don't know. I think it depends on where you work, where you buy your games, if anybody actually pays attention. Uh, I have bought M mature games for my kids before my oldest was 17. Uh, I check it out. I try to limit some of the options as much as possible. But, um, you know, my, my idea is I, I can't raise my kids in a bubble. I would rather that they be exposed to stuff while I'm sitting next to them rather than um, somewhere else where they're not quite sure how to navigate it on their own. 
All right, we're very familiar with criticisms of video games. What do they do to us? Well, they make us fat, they make us lazy, they make us antisocial, and they make us violent, right? You've heard of all those criticisms. I'm going to propose that you check out a book by Steven Johnson called Everything Bad is Good for You. The idea behind this book is that, you know what? Everything you've been told is bad for you is actually good for your brain because it's honing different skills in your brain than other media. So he compares it to reading. And here's what I like about video games compared to reading. And nothing will ever replace reading as an absolute necessary skill. But bear with me for a second. If I'm reading a book by Jane Austen, who's in charge of the story? It's Jane, right? I am along for the ride that Jane has provided. And when I start Pride and Prejudice, every single time I read Pride and Prejudice, the ending is the same, the story is the same, the characters are the same right? It's a linear story and it's the same every single time and I am just a participant in a story created by someone else. Now, if you're playing video games, it's non-linear, meaning the story can go any way you want it to. You are in charge of moving in this world that in many cases you have created. You have to solve puzzles. You have to fail and try again and again. You have to prioritize. You have to make decisions. You can collaborate with people to achieve goals. The ending isn't always the same because it's nonlinear. And you are in charge of the story. So as a parent who wants their kids to grow up to be creative and in control of, them, of their environment, why wouldn't I choose video games over a book? I'm not saying that I'll say, you know, son, put the book down and grab the Xbox controller. <laughs> Never said that. But the idea that video games are horrible is, is something that I struggle with. I don't think that enough attention has been paid to the way that they can help our brains. Okay, bear with me. I'm showing you an example from SimCity 4. Okay, I'm sure you've all played it at least a little bit. My, let's see, middle son, when he was in seventh grade, hated social studies. Hated it, right? You sit in a row, you listen to a teacher talk about history, you get worksheet packets, you're bored out of your mind, right? He was down on the computer one day and he comes upstairs and he says, Mom, I balanced my budget, I figured out how to keep my mail rating good, I've got my taxes set at a level where new businesses come in, but I'm still making enough money. And I said, you're learning social studies. No, I'm not. I'm playing on the computer. I didn't want to push him and say, uh, honey, you're learning social studies. But the idea is gamification. He is learning social studies concepts and civics concepts while he is relaxed playing a game in a challenging environment. You want to tell me that's not active learning going on in his brain? It's amazing. And yet, what would most teachers say if I said, you know what, I want to buy your social studies classroom a copy of the software? What would they say? Oh, it's a video game. Isn't that kind of sad? I think it's sad. All right, here's some more from Steven Johnson. And I kind of mentioned this before. There's a lot of video gaming that is not fun. It's work. It's challenging. And yet, in that environment, you continue to try. You continue to solve that puzzle. You continue to try to get to the next level. It's very, very active. And I think that this reminds me of the sleeper curve, which is what we talked about with the television chapter. Of course this makes you smarter. You're working. Your brain is working. You're not sitting there zoned out. Now, there are games where you can kind of zone out. Um, 2048, I zone out. Ruzzle, I zone out. Um, I never got into Angry Birds, but I've seen people play Angry Birds like they're hypnotized. Okay. Um, so certainly, some games are more active than others, but to say that all video games are bad is a sweeping generalization. And to say that video games make us violent, I think is problematic, because if that was true, 
we would all have shot up our schools by now. We've all been exposed to video game violence, and yet not all of us turn out to be killers. In fact, there is some research that suggests that video games are actually cathartic, that you can be really angry and feel violent, and a video game will help you relax, help you get it out of your system instead of getting it out of your system in real life. So yeah, I've made some enemies at baseball practices in the past because of my opinions on this, and I look forward to debating all of this in class with you. So be sure to contact me with questions and observations. Okay, see you bye.